Amen. We ready to jump into the Word of God this morning? I'm excited. Are you excited? God is faithful. And uh, we have a series this month that Ryan kicked off last Sunday called First Things First and the power of one. And one, I'm gonna start with you this morning with the Hebrew symbol for one. Is it okay if we teach a little Hebrew this morning? All right, so one is more than just a number, even though this is the first month of the year, we wanna focus on God as one. So it is a symbol of beginning, it is first. So the ancient symbol for one is the Aleph, It means word, the word means master or teacher when we read this in Hebrew. It has the numeric value of one, but it is the symbol from which we get the A in our alphabet or the alpha in alpha and omega when Jesus referred to himself in Greek. He said, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. This is the Hebrew symbol for Eleph. So every symbol in Hebrew is both, we know, a number, a letter, and a word. And that is just the beginning of what that symbol represents. Hebrew is a language of pictures. It's almost like a hieroglyph, if you know what that is. It's also phonetic, and there's no sound to this symbol. Aleph is silent. It is both profoundly simple in Hebrew and wonderfully complex, which I love. Each detail of Hebrew symbol further expresses the compound meaning. So the Aleph is made up of three symbols in one. This symbol at the top is called the upper Yud. It is the numeric value of 10, and it is representative of God in heaven. The center symbol is a Vav, This is a connection, it's a value of six. So it represents six in Hebrew. So you'll see that this is a numeric equation as well. But the Vav means connection or to connect. And that's the connection between heaven and this lower Yud is 10 as well in numeric value. But Yud means um, redemption. Vav means connection. So the symbol of the oneness of God It represents a connection to mankind with the Torah. So traditionally, they see this vav, this connection, as the Torah connecting heaven and earth, God's word, God's voice to mankind. But you and I, as New Testament believers, we see a profound additional revelation to this as the upper, because think pre-fall in the garden, The oneness of God would have been God speaking with man. Adam was the connection between heaven and earth. Adam had full access to heaven. He could go back and forth, and he had ultimate authority on earth. But when he fell in the garden because of sin, the Bible says sin entered the earth through one man, Adam. Because of sin, it broke the connection in the cosmos between God and man. Conversation was made more difficult with man because of sin. But as New Testament believers, we are able to see that it's not just the Torah the word of God, but Jesus says, I was the word from the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word is Jesus, the divine connection, building the bridge between heaven and earth. So this represents, the individual parts of the Aleph represents and show us the greater meaning of the oneness of God, the Trinity, if you will, as well through the wholeness of God's master plan. The oneness of God is demonstrated in the Aleph through God's singular mission. That singular mission is salvation. That's the ultimate sign of redemption. So what's beautiful about this for us is seeing God, Jesus, and mankind, and Jesus being the ultimate connection. What we see here is God's master plan for our restoration from the very first beginning of time. He made a way from the beginning, and we see that culminating in the symbol of one. Everything comes together. The full mission comes together from the very beginning. Additionally, the Aleph represents the unity of the three parts of God. God as the Father above, Jesus as the intercessor, the mediator, the go-between, 
and the Holy Spirit as the comforter who lives with us here on this planet, okay? So the three parts of God are shown through the symbol. God is whole, complete, and he is one. Not only one in unity, but one in position. Ordinally, in order, God is one. So every great thing begins with Aleph. Every great thing begins with the Alpha, with the beginning. Every great thing begins with God. Amen, say that to your neighbor. Every great thing begins with God. Every new thing begins with God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We love the Lord our God with our heart by acknowledging God in his position ordinarily in our life. He comes first, first things first, right? And according to Deuteronomy, the right response to his oneness is love. So we love him with our heart by acknowledging him. We love him with our soul by honoring him. And we love him with our service, our strength by serving him. So our devotion is to put first things, put him first in all things. He alone knows the end from the beginning. So what does that mean in January 2020? That means that we should seek first before we set goals, amen? We should pray first before we make plans. We should listen first before we seek opinions and we should give first before we ask for more. We should worship first before we take new ground. So January 2022, first things first, all right? We on the same page? All right, so because God is central and first in our lives, we begin everything by talking to him. We call communication with him or speaking to God, we call it prayer. The word prayer simply means to ask. It means to petition. Matthew 7, 7 says this. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. This gives us a divine disorder, though, to how we typically go about setting out for a new goal. You and I, when we, we go about achieving something, we, we tend to seek what it is we want, figure that out, and then find the door of opportunity and knock on the door of opportunity. And then when the door opens, we ask for what we need. But he gives us a different, a divine disorder to that plan. And he says, first I want you to start with asking me. Before you get to a door of opportunity, before you knock on anything, before you seek what you think you want, I want you to start with prayer. Pray first, ask first. And you know, this divine disorder shifts everything from you and I being heirs of salvation, joint heirs with Christ, it shifts our position from this needy, wanty, you know, uh, beholden people going out into the world thinking the world can fulfill or give us something that we have to beg for. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't go to the world asking. You start by asking me, what is my will? What is my word? What is my way? And when you start with the answer, then you know how to seek. And then when you know how to seek, the door of opportunity you knock on opens to you, but it opens to you, not just you as a beggar and a receiver, but you as a giver of solution, of wisdom, of vision, of revelation, of insight, of new inventions, strategies. So it changes your demeanor and position when you change the order and go about it how Jesus says. He says, start with asking me. Because if you'll start with asking, you're gonna end up at a door of opportunity as the one holding what's treasured, not the one in need. This is how God wants to empower us. That's why it's so vital for us to pray first. And it really takes us back to the garden. Can I just take you through a history of prayer? Where it came from? You know, the word palal, the first time prayer is used in the Bible is actually in a story we're gonna go over in just a moment, the story of Hannah. But before that, the, the Bible would just cover conversation between God and man. It started in the garden. The Bible says that Adam and Eve would walk with God in the cool of the day. After the fall took place, 
God cries out to them. He, he shows up for the walk, and they're not there. And he cries out to them and says, Adam and Eve, where are you? And they respond and say, here I am, we're hiding. We were shamed, we're afraid because of what we've done. And he said, who told you you were naked? Who have you been talking to? The conversation shifts to defense mechanisms after sin enters the picture. And the goal of sin, the enemy sent sin and temptation and accusation for one purpose. That's to separate us from hearing the voice of God. He knows if you can commune with God, you can be on the same page. And if you're on the same page, you are then joint heirs of salvation and you're a threat to the enemy. You're not a victim. You're an overcomer. So then we see after Adam and Eve walked with God and, and communion and conversation really changed after the fall, it says then in Genesis 4.26 that people begin to call on the name of the Lord. It doesn't use the word prayer, but we know what that means, is a desire for communication. We also, throughout the lives and stories of the patriarchs of the Bible and the matriarchs of the Bible, we see that God spoke to Noah about a flood. God spoke to Abram about a child. God spoke to Moses from a burning bush. He spoke through judges and prophets like Deborah of the Old Testament. But we don't find much of a pattern we could call prayer. Aside from the consistent call from God, he would say their name and then they would respond with a subsequent answer of, here I am. Adam and Eve, who were running from him, said, here I am, hiding in the bushes. And then Moses, who was running from Egypt, said, here I am, even though he really didn't know who he was. So it appears that God, throughout the history of prayer, it appears he was eager to connect with mankind, right? He instigated much of the conversation. But then we come to a story about a barren woman. You know, there wasn't anything like really special about this woman, except she's known for her pain. She's a woman who doesn't come from, you know, a, gl a glamorous tribe. Her husband isn't really that well known, but she's barren and she's the first wife of a man named Elkanah. And because she's barren, he takes another wife named Penina and she just pops out kids year after year after year. Well, every year, Elkanah brings his two wives and their children to worship, to sacrifice for the yearly feasts. And when he brings them on this one particular year, Hannah has just had it because Penina, her sister wife, is cruel to her. She makes fun of her. She mocks her for not having children. But Elkanah loves Hannah more than he loves Penina. So he gives Hannah a double portion of all of the sacrifice, the food and the feast. But Hannah is grieving. She wants a child. So she pushes herself away from the dinner table and finds a place to pray. She goes to the, the steps of the tabernacle and throws herself on the stairs and she weeps and grieves out of bitterness of heart, the Bible says. And as she's crying out, the high priest, Eli, he's watching everything, all the festivities going on. He catches her and watches what she's doing. He can't hear what she's saying, but her lips are moving. He walks up to her and he says, woman, you need to sober up. This isn't a place or a time for drunkenness. When are you gonna stop drinking? And she responds to him and says, I'm not drunk. I haven't been drinking. I'm, my heart is broken. I want a child. I've been praying for a child. And she responds to him in honor. She could have responded out of offense because he was wrong and he was judgmental and he was cruel in the way that he spoke to her. But instead she says, my Lord, sir, I, I'm not drunk as you think I am. I'm brokenhearted. And Eli sees that he was wrong and speaks to her and says, may the Lord give you the desire of your heart. She goes home and uh, is with her husband and conceives a child. And when she was praying for this child, she made a vow to the Lord and said, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. So God remembers her when she goes home. And she remembers to keep her word. So after she's finished weaning Samuel as a very young child, little more than a toddler, she makes a linen garment for him because they didn't have linen ephods for toddlers. And she drops him off at the tabernacle to serve under the high priest Eli. 
So little Samuel is there dropped off and a few years after he's been serving there, the Bible says that he lays down to go to sleep. And when he's laying down to sleep, he thinks Eli is calling him. So he gets up, he goes to Eli, the high priest, and says yes, and Eli says, I didn't call you. He goes back and lays down again, he hears his name, gets up again, goes to Eli, and finally on the third time, Eli says, I'm not calling you. This is so profound because lots of times we need to get this from man. Mankind doesn't call you. Don't get the voices mixed up. God calls. So Eli says, this is God's voice, so go lay back down, and when you hear it again, say, your servant is here, I'm here, and I'm listening. That was Eli's instruction. So this child becomes the high priest, Samuel. He grows up, he hears God, he speaks on God's behalf, and he anoints the first kings of Israel, Saul and King David. So this child who hears God, I want you to get this, was born of a mother who prayed. A mother who pushed out of her discomfort, who made herself vulnerable. Hannah positioned herself to be heard to the point of being misunderstood. And because prayer is a conversation, the power in prayer is not only in being heard, but it's in being answered. Amen? That's the power in prayer. That's when we know that our prayers are effective. So I want to just take a moment and let's look at the difference at, at how, at, between how Hannah heard God and how Samuel heard God. Hannah was accused of being drunk by the high priest, the spiritual leader of her people, and yet she responded to him with honor. She showed honor in spite of the imperfection of God's representative. And because of her spiritual, not her physical position, but her spiritual position of honor and submission, she heard an answer from God through that imperfect leader. You wanna know what God sounds like? Hannah heard God and got an answer through someone who misjudged her, misunderstood her, got the whole situation wrong. God still spoke to her through that imperfect vessel. But this woman who presses through the imperfect representative, the imperfect process, the, the discomfort, she presses in, and what is the result? The result of that is she has a child who a few years later, her son Samuel, hears an audible voice of God. What parents do has a generational impact on the position our children have to hear God. Right now, as parents, I just wanna encourage you for a moment. You may have to push through a lot of imperfection. You may have to make the decision and everybody's throwing a fit and not wanting to come to church and you're pushing through. It's hard for you, it's not easy. It's like Hannah, you feel surrounded by judgment and misunderstanding and yet you keep being faithful, you keep pressing in, you keep pushing away from other people's opinions and you show up to the house of God. And when you do that, you then raise children who you have fought to put in proximity so that they hear the voice of God for themselves. I am so grateful. I would have to tell you, other than the grace of God, which is um, indefinable in my life, I, I'm so honored and grateful that God gave me parents who made sure I was at church. I'm standing here because of the Sunday school teachers who taught me every week. Before I was the age when I could even understand the, the, the lead pastor of our church who happened to be my father. I sat in Sunday school rooms every Sunday and received the word of God. My most treasured possession is a red Bible that I got in October 1979. And when you open the Bible in the front, I was five years old in 1979. And you open it and it says, this is presented to Amy Hayes by her teachers, Debbie Rose, and, and named the other one, and it says below that, for memorizing 13 memory verses in two Sundays. The reason I was able and am able now is because my parents put me in proximity to be taught the word of God, to hear the voice of God. 
They didn't do it all on their own. Even though they were great teachers, they delegated that to the house of God and made sure I was in proximity. And I know they pushed past offense over the years. I know I had imperfect communicators that taught me, but my parents made sure that the, the first things stayed the first things. And what's scary is we can be raised in church and then start to begin, because of whatever's going on in the world, looking at being a part of the body of Christ as something that's optional for us. I could take it or leave it. You know what, you may not need it as badly as your children, but what you make optional, your children and the next generation will consider unnecessary. Because your kids don't follow what you say is a priority. They follow what your priority is. And that's demonstrated by your passion to put yourself and them in a position to hear the voice of God. And that was Hannah's commitment. And it had eternal impact. Because let's look at, she raised up a son, Samuel, who becomes the high priest of Israel. He anoints the kings of Israel. And then we go in the era, if we can go through history, we're gonna fast forward really quick to the New Testament. So all of the kings of Israel then are, God is speaking to them and through prophets to them. They go into exile. The northern kingdom of Israel is taken captive in Persia. That's where we get the story of Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah. And the southern kingdom of Judah is taken captive to Babylon. That's where we get Daniel and the, all the books of the Bible that are, are about the exile for the southern kingdom. So all of Israel is in exile and God is speaking to them through prophets. So you have Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jonah, all of these prophets, all right? I'm just giving you some context, all right? Is that okay? My husband said, don't ask you if you're okay, but <laughs> I'm sorry. So then we get to the exile, the end of the exile, and Nehemiah is bringing back Jerusalem. People are coming back to Jerusalem, and we enter a silent 400-year stretch of time when there are no more prophets God is not speaking through prophets for 400 years. The high priest goes through the ritual of the Day of Atonement where he, he identifies a spotless, perfect lamb and then he brings that lamb in for the Day of Atonement. They sacrifice the lamb, they pour the blood of this innocent, perfect lamb on the mercy seat and God looks at sin and only sees the sacrifice and they are forgiven but it's pushed one more year Forward. So for 400 years, the high priests are just going through the rituals. Fast forward 400 years to a high priest by the name of Zechariah. He's at the temple and he's going about these rituals that they've just been going through the motions but not hearing God. And God shows up, an angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah. This is the beginning of the New Testament. Zechariah is the high priest his wife is the cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the angel of the Lord speaks to Zechariah and says, I'm doing a new thing. Your barren wife is gonna produce a son and I don't want you to name him after yourself because I'm breaking with tradition. This new son that would be the future high priest will not serve empty religion any longer. I'm calling him out of this box, this broken system. I want you to name him John. So he names him John, we know him as John the Baptist, the greatest prophet of all time, and the first prophet after 400 years of silence. What I want you to see the beautiful picture here because we're talking about praying and the purpose and power and even the pattern of prayer we're about to get into in just a minute. John the Baptist, who if he would have followed in his father's footsteps, he would have been the one year after year to find a spotless lamb to prepare it for sacrifice, to go into the Holy of Holies and to pour out the blood of this spotless animal over the mercy seat. But because God was doing a new thing, but nothing God does is random. Everything God does fulfills something. So God uses this man, John the Baptist. The Bible said he's crazy. He goes out into the wilderness pre preparing the way of the Lord, the way of the Messiah. And this is why this picture is so thrilling and so beautiful because if John would have stuck with tradition, 
If God hadn't have called him out, he would have been the one year after year picking a spotless lamb, but he said goodbye to that job description, moves out to baptize people, and little does he know those words would come from his mouth because Jesus begins to walk toward him to submit to baptism, and John looks in front of a crowd of thousands, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And in that moment, right then, all the years of empty ritual and religion were put on Jesus. All of those years, he became the lamb of atonement in that moment. He surrendered and submitted to baptism as an honor of authority under John the Baptist. And this brings us to Jesus as high priest. So he's the lamb and the high priest. And, and the apostle Paul says it like this in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended to heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace. Remember the Aleph, the broken system. He's saying now this Jesus, this Vav, this connector has built a bridge and made a way as the high priest so that now you can go boldly with confidence before the throne of grace so that you may receive mercy and find grace to help you in your time of need. We don't pray to Jesus. We pray through Jesus. We pray to God. In fact, Jesus gave us the pattern for perfect prayer. And if you're taking notes, I want you to pull out your, this is a, uh, you're gonna have seven points right here. I don't typically give numbered points, but we're going to because these are important and they'll carry you through the next 21 days of prayer and fasting. This is the perfect pattern for prayer and it, it, it reestablishes our place in prayer. He said, pray like this, Matthew 6, nine through 13, Jesus says, this is your pattern, pray like this. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the power and the glory forever. Now, this perfect prayer demonstrates that our position is just as important as our petition. Your position puts you in a place for your petition to be heard. And it's a prayer that returns us to the pre-fall garden state of close relationship with God. It's an instructional prayer. So when Jesus said pray like this, the first point is honor. He introduces us to an idea and a perspective of God that we have never had. You know, when you and I read the Bible, we think of God as Father, even in the Old Testament, but you know that was not a concept until Jesus introduced God as Father. He's the one who made that connection. Why? Because he wants us to see the intimate desire for relationship. So we honor God, number one, by coming into alignment with his authority. Our Father, who is in heaven, your thoughts are higher than mine, your ways are higher than mine. I honor the difference in perspective, God, between you as my Father. But then we say, and number two is surrender to authority. We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So essentially that's saying, not my will, not my kingdom. Every king needs three things, a king, we need a king for a kingdom. We need a domain in order to have a kingdom. And a kingdom and a, a domain need culture in order to be a kingdom. Culture is the language, the customs of a kingdom. So when we surrender our will to God's, it's a divine positioning and exchange. So when we say, not my will, but your will be done, I'm the domain, I'm the land, I'm, I'm the kingdom that I am making God's. When we say, on earth as it is in heaven, that puts us in a place then, which is number three, the purpose of prayer. 
is for the kingdom to come and his will to be done, but the purpose is to connect heaven and earth. That's always the purpose in communing with God and conversation with God. How do we do that? Many of us get to purpose and petition and forgiveness and protection and praise, and I'm gonna take you to those in a minute. We skip right over the part that requires that we come into submission through surrender to the authority of God. Because see, we can't, the purpose of prayer is making heaven come to earth. But we don't have the authority to do that if we have not first submitted and surrendered to authority. This I would say, if I was giving a leadership talk right now and telling you what is the secret to success spiritually, to being used of God, to stepping into your anointing with boldness and confidence and authority. The key to authority is submission. If you wanna work outside of the authority of what God is doing as an anomaly, if you don't submit to authority, you have no authority. Authority comes through a chain of command. And what I have learned, my authority in the spirit has increased exponentially with every decision to submit to the authorities in my life. There are times when I don't agree with requests my husband has for me, right? Maybe a couple times over the years that I haven't agreed. And what the Holy Spirit taught me is, Amy, honor is not based on performance, the world would tell you, you can't respect somebody unless they perform the way that you want them to. Respect is based on performance. Honor is a kingdom word, it's a higher word. Honor is based on position. And I've learned over the years in my marriage and my ministry that, that it doesn't come without the price of submission. The more I submit, the more authority I get. And submission does not count as submission unless I disagree. Because if I agree with what I'm being asked to do, it doesn't cost me anything to submit. Submission counts when I don't agree. And there have been so many times, innumerable times, I have not agreed with what I've been asked to do. And I submitted. And that is the only reason I have spiritual authority. Is the degree to which you submit enables you to have authority. Why do you need authority? Because if we don't have authority, then the purpose of prayer is nullified. Because if the purpose of prayer is bringing heaven to earth, the Bible says, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That's not talking about the perfect third heaven where God lives. That's talking about the heavenly places right over our head where principalities and powers exist, where forces of darkness and oppression exist. So when the Bible says the purpose is for you to bind with your authority of submission to God's will, his way, you're praying the right way by saying, I bind on earth this spirit of depression that is squatting over my house and is ruining the conversation and thought life of my children, you begin to bind on earth. It's bound in heaven. You take authority over the things that have come against you in heavenly places right over your head. You have the authority to do that, to bind, to loose, to lose peace, to lose joy. You have a right. Did you know two-thirds of the kingdom are happy feelings. It says that the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Peace and joy are feelings. You feel those two things. You have a right to bind and loose and to create an atmosphere, to pray out loud, to shift things by opening your mouth, but you don't have any authority if you're not surrendered, if you're not submitted. Okay, so the fourth is petition. This is the part of the prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread. I love bread. And I'm happy to pray for bread every opportunity I get. But bread is not really the point of Jesus including this. He's basically saying, whatever it is that you desperately need today, this is the part and the position and the time frame in the prayer, the order of the prayer in which you make that petition. After you've surrendered through honor, submission, aligned yourself with God, knowing his way is higher than yours, 
his thoughts are higher than yours. You may not know what to pray. Romans says, Romans 8 says, I don't know how to pray what I should pray. This is why when we go to God first and surrender our will, he gives us then the words and the, and the picture of what to ask for. So petition is provision. And then number five, the prayer contains forgiveness. After Jesus prayed this perfect prayer, just a few verses later, he says this. He says, if you won't forgive your neighbors, God in heaven will not forgive you. So he's, he's telling us right here, because every point in this prayer is a divine exchange. It's I'm giving my will for his will. I'm giving my kingdom for his kingdom. I'm giving forgiveness and I'm receiving forgiveness. It's all an exchange. So forgiveness is both giving and receiving in the prayer that we should pray. Number six is protection. He says it like this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus said, I know what temptation feels like. I don't wanna be in the proximity to be tempted. God, can you lead me around situations where I don't even have to encounter that? I don't wanna be tested in that way. You can pray that. God, make a way of escape for me out of this situation. And then number seven, he ends it with praise. All glory being given to God. That is our testimony. And the word of God, it says we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That's why it's so important for us whenever the enemy comes to try to target us with negative beliefs or um, depressive thoughts, for us to then be able to lift our eyebrows and our face and our countenance and say, but God is good and I know that I will see the faithfulness of God in the land of the living. He's brought me through harder things than this. I've never gone a day where I've been starving. God's taken care of me. He will make a way through this. And I won't even remember the trial or the process because I'm gonna give him all the glory. The story belongs to him. So the perfect prayer is a complete exchange. It's hard to hear God though, and I want you to catch this. It's hard for us to hear God when you've already decided what you want him to say. When that's in the way, none of the rest of this stuff works. When it's like, here God, here is my will, here's the blueprint, I'd like you to just sign off on, can you deliver all of the resources to make this happen, this is how I'm gonna build my life. And uh, that's not how we hear God. That's how we interfere, that's where noise comes in. So this prayer is a prayer of exchange. I exchange my authority for his through honor. I exchange my will for his through submission and surrender. I exchange this kingdom for his kingdom. I exchange myself with him as my source. I exchange the temporary for the eternal. I exchange the accusation of the enemy and that conversation. I want you to make the connection is the enemy is tormenting you day and night all the time with thoughts accusing God, accusing God to you. And then he goes before God and accuses us to God. He's driving a wedge. His goal is that there isn't intimacy because when there's intimacy with God, there's always a divine exchange. So how should we pray? We pray by honoring first. Honor first means pray first, seek first, ask him first. And then how do we hear him? It bothers me when Christians say that God is speaking, but their Bible isn't speaking, but their Bible is closed. You want to hear God. You need to know his language, his tone, his cadence. When you know someone, you know what they would say and what they wouldn't say. And the only way to learn his language is by reading his word, hearing his word. Do you know we're called to a sound? I know my dad's voice very well. He's the founder of this church and I, I've sat under his ministry all of my life and he has been my shepherd. And because I, I knew I was called to that sound, it's like the ability when he would open up the word of God, I would sit on the front row and I would, God would give me revelations one after the next that really had nothing contextual to do with what he was preaching on. But because I was under the sound, I was hearing what it was I needed to hear. So 
if reading the word of God is difficult for you, I encourage you, join the devotional for 21 days. We have videos that will go out every day to help you open the word of God, to make it easier to be able to take in the truth of the word of God. But you know, my dad, as I sat under his ministry for years and, and wanted to be trained to be able to do what he has done so brilliantly and effortlessly, I asked him one time when I was a teenager if I could see his notes. That was humorous. Because when I looked at his notes, it would be like a napkin with three words on it. And it would be like a four-week series. I'm like, where's the rest of this? Uh, it makes it really difficult later to try to help you write a book when we don't have any words in your notes. And so I was really excited to begin to start getting some cassette tapes from the late 70s and early 80s. So one of my Christmas gifts was a cassette player. And I have had the most fun going back and listening to the very first time my dad preached on Blood Covenant in 1981. And as I was listening to it, when I turned it on, his name is on the cassette. It's the old Faith World logo. I know it's him. I was sitting in the service. I remember the message. And yet, because of time, has aged this cassette, he sounds real high-pitched, right? Not just younger, but just high-pitched. And he sounds so country. I mean, really country. He was telling a story this last week. Well, he just doesn't sound country now. But he was telling a story on one of these tapes, and it was so funny because he said that this man was instantly healed of a tumor in the middle of the service, and it was this large tumor. And so the man um, barely had time to grab his britches because the tumor went away and his pants went, went down. And so my dad's telling this story, and he said, I told him he, he better grab his britches. I'm like, Stacy goes, that cannot be your dad. I'm like, it really, it is, and I know him. I know his cadence, I know the way he says things, but it sounds so different, but I know it's him. And I know it's him because I know his voice so well. And for you and I to hear God, the way that he speaks, he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. You're his sheep. God hasn't reserved his voice just for preachers and pastors and influencers. We are all his sheep. We have the ability to hear him speak. You know, they give us hearing tests to test our ability to hear. But there's no such thing as a listening test. Hearing is ability. I can hear, but I may not hear. Listening is about intention. It's about leaning in. So when you can hear, but you don't hear God, you have to look at your environment. Why can't I hear him? Is there noise? Is there interference? How does God speak? You know, he's been used to, to, to speak through a donkey. He's spoken through a burning bush. I th find it humorous that when God was trying to speak to Adam and Eve, he found them hiding in the bushes. So I'm thinking in God's humor is when he decides to speak to a man, and he, he, he says this, God says about Moses that he spoke to Moses as a man does a friend, face to face, right? He spoke to Moses. But how does he speak to Moses? through a burning bush. And it's humorous to me that I'm like, God just assumed you're hiding uh, bushes where I need to uh, meet with you because that's where I always find you, hiding in a bush somewhere. <laughs> so God has used anything and he can use everything to speak. He uses nudges, he uses feelings, he uses dreams, he uses affirmations, confirmations, signs, whispers. That's how God speaks. And I want you to see something that I've recently discovered that has really blown my mind. I was recently studying all the, the, the magnificent, unquestionable God encounters throughout the Bible. Every time that God would meet with someone directly or an angel would come and the word of the Lord would come. And I, I went to study it to look for patterns that's one of the, the lenses I use in studying the word of God is what is the pattern here? So when I began to look at all of the pa patterns of the encounters with God or an angel and they heard a word, I was shocked to find that the majority 
of the instances where the people had a God encounter where they were actually on the run from something or on the heels of a recent separation from their life as they'd known it. There, there was a dramatic shift in their inner circle. Think about this, God spoke to Cain after he'd been exiled. He spoke to Abram when Abram was on a migration from Ur to Haran. He gave Jacob a dream when he was fleeing his brother's wrath and he wrestled with Jacob when he was on the run from his father-in-law. He spoke to Moses while he was on the lamb after leaving Pharaoh's palace. He spoke to little Samuel who'd been dropped off by his mother in a foreign place with no friends. And he spoke to Elijah the prophet through a whisper after he was running from Jezebel, the evil queen. So what this tells me is that you don't have to be running from something to hear God. The key here when I was praying about this and asking God, what is the real connection here? And the Holy Spirit, this is how he speaks is through pattern and confirmation. Is this tells me that positioning ourselves to hear God may not have so much to do with trying to find him, but instead with separating ourselves from our world enough to let him find us. Perhaps like all the examples of the Bible, that I've just given you, if we were able to unfollow the voices of our day and set ourselves apart, we would hear the whisper of our shepherd. When separating ourselves from the overriding voices and oppression of opinions, perhaps like Moses, we could encounter our own voice from the burning bush pulling away from everything. In every case that I've mentioned, God's intention and communication was to call their name, to draw them out, and to introduce himself in a new and powerful way. But what created the separation wasn't the reason for the God encounter. I want you to get this. It was simply that God got them all to himself. That's the key. That's the connection. You wanna hear from God? Maybe like Hannah, you need to push yourself away from the dinner table and say, I've been trying my life like this with all these opinions. I need to push away from this situation that has drained me of energy, of purpose. I believe many of you under the sound of my voice right now because you see, you know, the enemy can trick us. Even psychologically, he uses the fruit of the spirit against us and says, well, you're not faithful or long suffering if you separate yourself from this situation. You need to stay, you know, till the last dog is dead, you gotta stay. Perhaps the reason you're not hearing God is because you've set yourself up as your own savior in this situation. And God is saying to you, I need you to separate yourself from this. God's calling out to you and saying, where are you? Are you hiding? Because the most powerful prayer that we can pray in the next 21 days is a prayer of just here I am. It's the prayer of honesty. Because I know this to be true, that what God is saying to you and I right now, and it will be true tomorrow as it is today, he's calling out to you and he's saying, where are you? Where are you right now? I don't want this religious, pious, perfect prayer. I just wanna ask you where you are. Are you hiding? What are you running from? What are you afraid of? Because let me tell you this, when you turn around, you're not gonna find a God in a reception where he speaks to you and says, see, I told you so. You've done all these things wrong. If you just would have done this, that's not the kind of reception we get. When we say, here I am, which was the common answer through every God encounter in the Bible, was simply saying, I'm right here. I'm probably not where I'm supposed to be. I, I'm not even sure why I am where I am. Moses answered and said, here I am, 
but who am I? And who are you? I think that's interesting. He didn't even know who he was, but he still knew where he was. The prayer that you need to pray right now to God to activate the anointing, calling, and purpose of your life and the next steps for you. If you're discouraged, the greatest prayer you can pray is saying, God, I'm, here I am. I'm stuck in this situation. I'm afraid. I don't know what life looks like outside of this. I spent so much time in this place. I don't know how to hear your voice because all I hear is all of these other pervading opinions. And God is just calling you out of that place to separate, but that's something you and I have to do intentionally on our own. And the most powerful position in prayer we can take is honesty. Because honesty is the combination of humility and honor. God, I'm just gonna tell you, you already know. But it's important that I acknowledge where I am. Here I am. You found me. And lean into the whisper. Would you stand with me here and across every campus? And I want us to pray together what I'm calling the here I am prayer. The Holy Spirit is hovering over this right now. Our focus has been so much on where we want to be. But in order to get where we want to be, we need to acknowledge where we are. Where we are emotionally, where we are spiritually. We may be in a place of doubt right now and discouragement. God can handle that. All he's asking is that you say, here I am. He even used Moses when Moses said, here I am, send Aaron. God's just looking for the authenticity of the acknowledgement of, this is what I'm struggling with, God. Can I be real with you? I'm not sure you're real. I'm not sure, sure you're true. I want to believe, but I don't know. So many opinions, so many thoughts, so many obstacles. If you'll repeat this prayer after me, what we're gonna do is simply put ourselves in alignment with the perfect will of God and get our authority and power back to step out from behind the fig leaves and the shame. I feel like I'm talking to somebody right now where you are at a point in your life you never saw coming on a map. I would have to say I completely understand what that feels like. I've had several twists and turns in my life the last couple of years that I never saw on a map. But in every single one of those situations, just being honest with God about where I was in my faith and my doubts allowed God to meet me right where I was in that moment and to carry me out. God wants to do that for you. This is a season of rest and reinvention. I believe just like Samuel, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, go lay back down. Lay down and in that place of rest, I'm gonna call you. In that place of separation and separateness and fasting, I'm gonna call you. But if you wanna hear me, push away from all the other opinions and that has to be our vow today in our covenant. So repeat this prayer, if you will, after me. Father God, I thank you for the master plan of my life. You are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning, the middle, and the end. I surrender my plan for my life. I thank you, God, that you're coming in and making all things new. Lord, here I am. 
You see me at this point in discouragement and doubt, in failure and victory. You know my name. God, I ask that you whisper, voice of direction, pure guidance. Father, I thank you for your word, your will, and your way. Lord, here I am. I belong to you. Amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a shout in this place. He's good. Hallelujah. I know there was a lot of content today, but I really believe that God wants to take us a long way down the road this year. And he speaks what it is we need to hear. And you don't have to have gotten all seven points. And I believe the voice of many waters, the shepherd is present. And he's whispering exactly your next step and direction. But what I want you to take away from this word, because the word is living and active, and it separates, the Bible says. And in your heart and in your spirit right now, there should be a holy conviction, not condemnation, but a conviction to separate yourself from the voices that, that you've been hearing from, from the, the input, the feedback, the environment. Maybe it's time in this 21 days to not just ritually check it off the list and say, oh, it's something our church does every year, but for you to actually enter in. I am, I am putting a greater intention in my life for hearing God in the next 21 days. I'm gonna do something I've never done before because I wanna receive something I've never received before. And we have to do this in the day and the era that we're living in right now. There is a famine for hearing the voice of the Lord and not because he's not speaking, but because he's drowned out, the whisper is drowned out with all the other noise. But it's our job to lean in, to position ourselves in prayer with honor, with surrender, with submission, with for forgiveness, with our petition, and he'll give us provision and protection. I wanna encourage you this week to do something to separate yourself that you've never done before. This is your opportunity. Try something new. Just try something new. Pick one verse this week. Maybe it's Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. That's easy. Just memorize that verse. Just take one verse home in your heart. Hold on to that verse, whatever the Lord speaks to you, and he will continually. You know, I'm the kind of person that I don't ever like to watch a movie more than once because I can't forget the movie. So it's not enjoyable to watch a second time. And I've rarely read books a second time. Only my very favorite books do I read over and over. The Bible is a book that I have read more times than I can count. And every time I read it, it's like I'm reading it for the very first time because the word of God is living, it's active. It, it meets you right where you are. So find a reading plan, maybe the next 21 days, and read the word of God. Begin to immerse yourself and saturate yourself. And you know what? This year, God's gonna take you places you've never dreamed or imagined, because his word will make your path straight. It'll be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Can I bless you as we go this morning? Pastor Mike is bringing the word next Sunday, so be here, it's gonna be wonderful. I'll be here as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, and may he cover you with a name above all names, Jesus. Good day, God bless you.